Thank you. Uh, I am really delighted to be here. I've um, spent 24 hours so far in Little Rock, and I haven't had a, a dull or unpleasant moment yet, so uh, I really am feeling like I belong here. Uh, first want to... Um, first want to make this work. Okay. First, just want to uh, thank three of my students who really helped me a good deal in gathering some of the material for this talk. Uh, Malika Go uh, Bomek, D Naomi Damberville, and Greg Gagnon are three just terrific students who I am delighted to acknowledge before I do anything else. Now I'm going to show you a picture. Uh, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. This one may help to keep me from going many, many thousand over because I'm going to have to be controlling myself and be severe with myself around the time. So if we look at this picture, uh, what we see, I think, I think what probably most of you would say is a guy who kind of looks very happy with himself. He's this little old guy who is feeling really powerful. One little push and look what he can do. Uh, it's kind of a nice picture of being very effective in life. So let's see if just have a mental image for yourself of what the rest of the picture might look like. This is what, whoops, this, this is what it looks like. Uh, it, it tells almost the entire tale of what I want to talk about uh, tonight. Um, vicious circles. Uh, how things we do that seem to be to our advantage in the short run end up coming back to basically crush us in, in the long run and how we all get entangled in these vicious circles. Uh, when I work with individuals in psychotherapy, I'm often looking at how the circle works in terms of how the internal state, the thoughts, the feelings, the perceptions, the anxieties that we have, which is what psychotherapists usually focus on, uh, need to be supplemented in our attention by looking at how that internal state leads us to actually act in the world and how when we act in the world, there are consequences, and those consequences feed back, just like in the picture you just saw, uh, and often keep us stuck in the same old rut. And I, I'll talk about that in a number of ways. When I work with couples, or when we're thinking of people in pairs, there are similar circular patterns. Uh, there's the sort of cultural cliche of, I drink because you nag, no, I nag because you drink, I do this because you do that, I do that because you do this. Each side pointing to the other side as the reason why they do what they do. And you can probably already guess that I'm going to then apply a similar perspective to looking at race relations. Uh, now, just another example in this that shows the circle that in a couple, the person who is with, is, if one partner is uncommunicative and withholding, the other partner is likely to push for the person opening up and saying more, and in pushing, that gives the reason for the first partner to uh, pull back further, you're being too pushy, you're, you're making it hard, I, w I would be more open if only you didn't push so much, I wouldn't push so much if only you were more open, and it keeps going and going. And uh, uh, before we go, go to race, I should just mention that in, in, among family therapists, when they talk about these circular patterns, they have a very interesting term that they use. They talk about the punctuation of the pattern. And what, by that, what they mean is people tend, when there's a circle like this uh, in, uh, in their lives, 
uh, they tend to reduce it to a linear explanation. You know, I do this because you did that, which means it started with you're doing that. But the problem in punctuation is that each of them say it started a different way. The, the, um, The, 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 this person says, I'm only doing this because you did that. This person says, I'm only doing this because you did that. The punctuation is different. They each have a partial picture, but where it begins and where it ends becomes the crucial point of contention. Now, in race, it's a little different because in race relations, there is a clear starting point. Uh, Almost everybody now agrees that the starting point was slavery. And almost everybody agrees, whites as well as blacks, that that was a grave injustice. And so we're all in a way in agreement about the punctuation in terms of the past. But we still argue about punctuation in terms of how things are perpetuated in the present. Because as I will try to show you, there are similar kinds of circles and similar kinds of debates about punctuation. And as long as we fail to see how we all participate in the pattern, we are much less likely to be able to solve what we're dealing with. Um, this is the central theme in my, in my book, Race in the Mind of America, looking at these circles, how we evoke behaviors in each other. Um, and really part of what I want to emphasize today is that unless we are aware of the circular na nature of the pattern, we not only aren't we likely to solve it, but the very denial that it is a circle is part of the problem. And again, I will try to show you some studies that illustrate how that works. Um, we, our dialogue is very linear. Uh, if we look at what the experience of African Americans is, what they hear, and it's not always explicitly stated. Often it's subtle, it's communicated without words, and often communicated without the person making the accusation even really fully conscious of what they're saying, but the impact is clearly registered. And the complaint, the linear description is you know, lots of laws have been passed, so now the playing field is even. And if you're not making it, it's because you're playing the victim card, because you're not taking responsibility for your life. If you were willing to work hard, you could make it like everyone else. And getting that message can be a, an, an infuriating experience for people who, A, are working hard, and B, are getting all sorts of demeaning messages that are not being acknowledged. On the other hand, because it's not just linear, whites also hear things that irritate them and feel unjust. They hear that they're racist, that they're committed to maintaining white privilege, whether they acknowledge it or not, that they don't really respect African Americans, they don't really give them a fair chance, and so both sides hear accusations, both sides feel the accusations are unjust, and very often all of this goes on without a lot of conscious knowledge even of exactly what's going on. So first let's just, because I'm going to be talking about inequalities, let's just review what I'm sure most of you at a place like this are well aware of, but let's just put it in front of us for a moment. So we're reminded of how we are not yet, by any means, in a state of equality. Uh, if we look at, at average household income, for example, the, 
have to learn to differentiate between moving the slide ahead and pointing the pointer. Uh, in each of these, the, uh, oh no, I'm, I'm at high school, I've already moved, them. okay, this one first. Um, if you look at these, pretty much throughout this 30-year period or so, the income of African-American families is about only 60% of white families. It did go up, it was on an upward trend, it went up significantly by 2000, uh, something that those of you here at the Clinton School should feel good about in identification because during the Clinton years, things did start to really improve significantly. Since then, as we see, there's actually been a decline again so that things are hardly better than they were 30 years ago. A consistent, huge differential in income. If we look at uh, high school dropout rate, we see that although the overall rate has declined, it's double pretty much consistently, just about double for African Americans. And this figure actually, and probably several of these figures, underestimates the difference because another aspect of our inequalities, the number of black males who are in prison, takes numbers out of this. They're not figured in the total, so this would actually be a higher number still. So we see another uh, marker of inequality. Uh, household wealth, which is often ignored when people talk about income, uh, it's even more dramatic. Uh, it was 12 to 1, dropped to 7 to 1, now is about 20 to 1. That means the average white household has 20 times as much resources backing them up in hard times than the average black family. So we see enormous inequality persisting. And what's important is bearing in mind that these all persist 150 years after slavery ended, many years by now after legal segregation ended, there have been all sorts of anti-discrimination laws passed, still we have these huge disparities. And the challenge for us is to understand why do they persist and what are the implications for public policy that they do persist. And there are similar findings in a lot of realms. Uh, segregation really still persists. It's no longer legal segregation, but the percentage of uh, neighborhoods that are really clearly uh, able to be identified as a predominantly white neighborhood or a predominantly black neighborhood persist throughout the country. Uh, so the question again is why this persists, and I'm going to argue it has to do with these vicious circles. So I want to start with a study that illustrates how some of these messages get across. And this was a very interesting study by uh, Davidio and Gardner. Uh, and let me tell you a little bit about, uh, it's a, a, a very cleverly designed study. The subjects were white undergraduates who had been selected because on measures of, uh, of, of prejudice, measures of racial bias, in terms of how they would fill out forms that they could consciously fill out. Uh, these were, uh, uh, this was a sample of very unprejudiced whites, uh, whites who uh, fervently believed that they uh, had transcended our nation's tragic history. And if you try to use measures that are overt, you will kind of replicate their view of themselves. But what this study did was it, it was set up to, to the, the, the subjects in the study, these white students, were told that they were, they weren't told they were in a study that had anything to do with race. They were told they were in a study uh, that was about uh, learning difficult cognitive tasks in pairs. And they were just going to be paired with another student and the two of them together 
would have to solve this, and we were looking at different patterns of cooperation in solving these tasks. Unbeknownst to these subjects, the other student they were paired with was actually a confederate of the experimenter, somebody who had been trained to participate in a particular way. And they also didn't know, because they just interacted with one person, that the study had been set up so that half the students, half these, these white students who were the subjects, uh, were paired with a black uh, partner for the task and half with a white partner. And for each of those, half of those, the other person was, in the way the task was described, either their supervisor in the task, as, as the two of them were doing it together, or their subordinate. Okay, is that, that clear? You're half white, half black, within each half supervisor, half subordinate. The actual measure was the confederate of the experimenter accidentally, in quotes, had to learn how to do this well, accidentally dropped a whole container of pencils. And the measure was, would these white students help the other person to pick the pencils up? So that with no idea that this was even part of the study. So here's, here's the findings. The first overall finding might look very encouraging and consistent with their not being biased against African Americans. In fact, they were somewhat more likely to pick them up when the person they were paired with was black rather than white. But if you look more closely, when they were paired with a white, they were more likely to pick up the pencils when the other person was their supervisor in this task than a subordinate. Even though this was all random and they knew that much, they knew that these assignments were random. Um, and I think that partly reflects just deeply ingrained habits we all have that we, you do things for the teacher, you do things for the boss, we defer to authority. So it's interesting, but not terribly uh, illuminating, that they, they did do it more for the, the supervisor. What's fascinating and troubling is, again, I have, I, I have to have a, a better, no, now I'm going way back. Uh, boy, did I, oh, I, I'm going in the wrong direction off here. No, it's not going backwards when it's, I'm sorry for this <laughs> lack of coordination. Um, okay, uh, now hopefully it will, all right, um, so, yeah. okay, uh, finally, okay, I'm, I'm showing that there, there may be some racial correlation between uh, coordination with these kinds of things, I don't know, uh, we'll, we'll later get to stereotype anxiety and I may be revealing some stereotype. Um, but when the confederate was black, they helped the supervisor less. And that's very striking. In other words, there's a reversal. It means that when these supposedly unbiased, unprejudiced whites were interacting with a black person in a subordinate position, they were comfortable. When, and they were generous, they picked up the pencils, but when they were interacting with a black person in a supervisory position, their behavior was very different. All occurring outside of any real awareness of what was being measured or what was going on. Um, and I wonder whether this has something to do with the the polls that show that many people 
say they are in favor of the Affordable Care Act but are opposed to Obamacare. What, is, what does that mean? I think it partly reflects the same phenomenon. We have a black man in a position of authority and a lot of white people don't want to pick up the pencils. And so they find some way to uh, re-describe. Um, so half the story that we are talking about so far is a, a kind of a troubling but familiar story that there are racial biases that whites continue to hold that they don't acknowledge and are not aware of. And that very often, if you're an African American in our society, you're aware of it and you encounter it, but you can't really address it effectively because the white person can't be confronted on it because he's not even aware he's doing it and yet he clearly is. Uh, but I don't want the picture to just be that, that there, in order to change it, we have to see how the reality is still more complicated than that. Uh, on the one hand, we can say that it's very uncomfortable to be at the other end of that kind of behavior over and over again. Uh, especially when the other person doesn't acknowledge that it's happening. But we also need to ask, if you're an African American who is encountering this all the time, how are you likely to act in your interactions with whites? Is there likely to be, on your part, behavior in response to this that contributes to perpetuating the circle, even though it's not your intent, just by your discomfort in the interaction. And now I'm going to turn to another study that actually demonstrates that in, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, this was a different kind of study. In this study, uh, there were two studies. The first one, white students interviewed uh, applicants for a job and again unbeknownst to them half the people they were interviewing were white and half the, the people were black and the questions were already written out so it was very very scripted and yet there was room for some interesting things that went on sub rosa first of all they they've uh, intentionally forgot to put chairs in the room. So the subject had to go out and get the chairs and place them. And one of the things they found was that when the white applicant was interviewing, a, uh, a, when the white interviewer was interviewing a black applicant, he placed the chairs further away than when he was interviewing a white uh, applicant not being aware that the measure of the chairs was even being examined. And it wasn't a comparison because each person only did it with one. So we're comparing groups. On average, the whites interviewing blacks placed the chairs further away, expressing, indicating some discomfort. They also, when they were talking, uh, showed a variety of speech disruptions. They uh, they stuttered, they didn't finish their sentences properly, uh, they did a lot more um, 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 even though they, were, you know, they, they had a set of questions to ask. And very interestingly, they ended the interviews earlier with the black applicants. So here again, we had a group of supposedly unprejudiced whites who uh, in unconscious ways are manifesting behaviors that are problematic and dismissive, not fully uh, comfortable or respectful. So again, we can ask, well, what does it li feel like to be the black person at the other end of such behavior over and over again, day after day, in different ways? 
And this study actually gives us a, an opportunity to examine that because there was a second study done. Uh, and here, the, uh, unlike the first one, the subjects were the applicants rather than the interviewers. The interviewers this time were the confederates of the experimenter. So they trained the interviewers to, now all white in, in, in both cases, interviewer and applicant are both white, but in half of them, the interviewers behaved toward the applicants the way they behaved, the way the people in the first study behaved toward whites, and in half they behaved the way they behaved toward blacks. And so that in one case they sat further away, they ended, ended it a little uh, earlier, they made more of these speech uh, errors, they were trained to be able to do that, and so on. And it turned out that these white applicants did more poorly and were less well-liked by judges who didn't know what condition they were in, just observing their behavior. They were less well-liked and were seen as hostile, these white applicants, when they were placed in the circumstances that the black applicants were placed in in the earlier study. So we see how being treated in a certain way almost inevitably leads you to behave in ways that create vicious circles where if the whites are uncomfortable with blacks, act less forthcoming, less friendly, less related, as we saw in study one, and then this is perceived by African Americans who are at the, the receiving end of this, there's evidence that this leads them to become less comfortable, to be less forthcoming, less related, even though both may consciously experience goodwill. And when they do, it leads to the whites, again, feeling uncomfortable because of the behavior they're experiencing, and then the blacks feel uncomfortable because of the behavior they're experiencing, and the circle turns round and round again, often without people even knowing what's going on. Uh, now, I'm going to talk about one more type of vicious circle here, and then I want to briefly talk about policy implications and then open it up for discussion. This is a, a, a line of work done by Claude Steele and his colleagues, uh, first at Michigan, then at Stanford, then at Columbia. Uh, and he has done a lot of work on what he calls stereotype anxiety. That uh, when you raise anxieties for people about the performance of their group on something that the stereotype says their group isn't good at, they do less well. Um, so, for example, because there are stereotypes about African Americans and intellectual ability, when you raise stereotype anxiety, the African Americans don't do as well. Because there are stereotypes about women in math, when you raise stereotype anxiety, women do less well in math problems. Because there are stereotypes of whites' innate athletic ability, when you raise stereotype anxiety about that, they do less well in athletic uh, endeavors. And here's the kinds of studies they do to illustrate this. Uh, and, and this is a really important set of, of studies. Uh, they present a set of difficult intellectual problems to uh, white and African American students in elite universities, students with a, a real investment in the intellectual realm. And when they presented it, as this is a test of intellectual ability, the white students did a lot better than the black students. So it looks like the white students just had 
better ability on it. Then they did one small but very significant change with a, an equivalent group. People were randomly assigned to one or the other condition. They said, these problems that we're giving you, we don't know anything about. These are something experimental that we're sort of just trying out. We, don't, we have no idea whether it measures anything at all. Uh, just do them. We just want to get some norms on them. And under those circumstances, the black students did every bit as well as the white students. It's the same set of problems. One way of framing it, the black students do much worse. Another way of framing it, they show that they have exactly the same ability. But when the stereotype anxiety isn't raised, then they can do up to their ability. So this is important for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, it helps us in combating prejudices because it shows how much of what looks like the confirmation of these stereotypes is due to the stereotype anxiety, not to any lack of ability. Um, but again, it doesn't tell the whole story because things get more complicated if we take a broader lens. To begin with, the stereotype anxiety situation is the one that we mostly encounter in the real, real world. Most people do think they're being evaluated on tests. It's the unusual circumstance where you think it's not ev evaluating your ability. And so what happens is the stereotype anxiety leads to poor, for, poorer performance, not because these students are less able, but because of the stereotype anxiety. So they do more poorly. When they do, it strengthens the stereotype, both for them and for whites. That strengthening of the stereotype increases the stereotype anxiety again, and the circle goes round and round one more time. Uh, Another even more disturbing part that you're all probably familiar with, though you may not know Steele's specific phrase, disidentification with school, all people, when they are subjected to painful situations, we protect ourselves in a variety of ways. Psychologists, when they're working with patients, call them defense mechanisms, but they're just part of our human heritage Part of what's adaptive about us, we don't just let ourselves continually experience pain and humili humiliation. We re-experience things. We make ad adaptations. And one of the things, tragically, that happens among a subset of African Americans is confronting these stereotypes over and over again they protect themselves by disidentifying with school, as, as Steele talks about it. And disidentifying with school means I won't study hard, I don't really care much about school, that's for whites, that's not for us, uh, and the results are tragic because when you disidentify and you don't study or pay much attention, you're going to do more poorly. And that, again, then strengthens the stereotype. And the same thing happens over and over again. Uh, it's just a variant of it. If I'm afraid I'm not good at intellectual pursuits because there are stereotypes, then I avoid intellectual pursuits. I don't develop the skills that I otherwise would have. That strengthens the stereotype. And it goes round and round again. Now. What this means is that even though there are not innate differences between groups, there can be differences that develop as a result of the very stereotypes that are prevalent in the society. And that means that if we're going to break the cycle, we can't just overcome bias. We have to address the impairments that previous injustices have created. And that's a difficult thing to really confront because we don't want to acknowledge from either side how much harm 
the inequalities and injustices in our society have done. So if we just say it's stereotypes, we can feel on the side of the angels, but the problem is then we're not addressing the deficits. And so we need to figure out how do we break the circle. This is the final part of what I want to talk about. First, we need to recognize that it is a circle. We need to acknowledge that we're all implicated in it, that we get caught in something where we are signaling to each other in ways that repeatedly evoke the same pattern over and over again. Uh, so we need, and, and secondly, thinking of, of Steele's work, we need to acknowledge that there's real discrimination, real inequality, remember all the figures for inequality that I cited before, and simultaneously that these have real world consequences, that there are deficiencies that need to be addressed and that it's the responsibility of a society that is still not equal to find out how to address those inequalities. Uh, this is just another variant of that and I want to leave time for discussion. So I just want to kind of emphasize one final thing which is uh, it bears on affirmative action policies, it bears on a number of things. We're not being fair if we just level the playing field because under cir current circumstances leveling the playing field doesn't level the playing field. And what do I mean by that? Leveling the playing field usually refers to sort of setting up rules that say everybody's now got the same opportunity. Here's the same requirements. Here's what you need to do. Anybody who scores above a certain point will get in and everybody who doesn't won't get in. That sounds like a level playing field. But it's not a level playing field when first of all blacks and whites enter the playing field from such vastly different starting points. Our starting point makes a difference as to whether the playing field is level. Not when they've gone to different kinds of schools, live in different kinds of neighborhoods, grow up in families with different parental income, and even more differences in parental wealth. Not when they daily encounter different behaviors like the kinds I was citing in these studies. The, the illustrated by the picking up the pencils or sitting further away and obviously that's just a representation of many, many, many experiences that occur every day in the texture of life in our society without being acknowledged, without being able to be clearly identified. It's not a, le a level playing field when the result of all these circumstances perpetuates the stereotypes, and the stereotypes then generate self-fulfilling prophecies that prevent people from achieving their real potential. And finally, and here people like me and probably many of you are implicated in this, it's not a level playing field when we think we're advocating social justice and we focus just on uh, trying to overcome discrimination and stereotypes. I say just because, and that's a really important word because I hope it's very clear, I do think there's real discrimination, I do think the stereotypes are crucial, we must devote a lot of attention to that. But if that's all we do, and we don't have a language to address the real harms, then we are going to fail. Affirmative action, for example, often is attending to only trying to make the playing field a little bit more level, maybe by changing the initial criteria, but that, and it's, it's a valuable and important part of the process, but again, if we allow people to attend schools and take jobs that they wouldn't have gotten, but we don't also attend to the real life experiences that may have prevented them from coming into those jobs with the same skill level and don't address that in some way, 
then we're going to recreate the problem over and over again. One of the dirty little secrets about affirmative action is that even though it tends to be conservatives who fight it and derive it, der deride it, I think affirmative action is something that conservatives love most of all. Why do they love it? First of all, it's cheap. It costs a lot less just to say, oh, we're going to let people have these jobs than to really engage in the kinds of programs that bring everybody up to the same level, that overcome all of these deficits and inequalities, and really make them prepared as fully, with as many advantages, for the job. That's expensive. Affirmative action has become kind of the poster boy for social programs in recent decades because it's cheap. And then conservatives also love affirmative action unconsciously. I don't think many of them would acknowledge loving it. Because not only is it cheap, but at the same time you can get to bitch about it. You know, that it's draining away the social tensions, but you can complain about it. But intervention programs are expensive. So preschool programs, you know, the Head Start, Perry Preschool, ABC, ABC Darien Pro Project, etc. There are debates about the effectiveness because they are both effective and limited. Uh, people who say they're ineffective, that's an ideological position that you can find data to counter it. They are effective, but they're not as effective as we wish they would be. And one of the reasons is that they're thought of, again, in a linear way. You administer this magic bullet, and you do the preschool, and now, now we can ignore these kids. Now, they're, now they've had their inoculation against racism. You know, they've had two years, three years, whatever, of preschool. Now we can ignore them. Again, we try to do it on the cheap. But you can't because they leave the preschool and they go into neighborhoods that are unequal, schools further along that are unequal. Uh, they encounter people who have had discouragement in the past. We continually live through the feedback we get from others, and before long, the advantages are wiped away because development even developmental psychologists often misunderstand development. You know, we all hear about how important the early years of life are. And they are. They start us on a course. But often, the early years are most important because having different experiences in your early years makes it likely you'll have different experiences in your later years. And it's those later experiences that keep it going. It's again part of the circle structure, not a linear structure. And if we're not attentive to changing the circumstances throughout life until this is really turned around, we're going to make great efforts and they're going to disappoint us. Um, so just to try to wrap up quickly, uh, wh what I want to, as, as, as the summary of what we're talking about here, we've gotten caught in a trap, in a vicious circle, very much like the vicious circles I see when I work with individual patients. Mutual cues and signals and behavior back and forth between us that keep us on a path toward perpetuating the conditions that we wish would finally be over. So that structure of causation, I think, is not really that visible in most plans about social policy, which tend to be based on linear models. So I want to leave you with that thought and then uh, listen for your comments and questions about this. So I will stop here. Let's, let's, uh, let's thank Dr. Walker here. We've got time for a few questions. Yeah, here's a question, uh, and wait for the microphone to get there. Get um, it's okay. It's on. Okay. Um, thank you. I enjoy listening to your opinions. To be honest, I disagree with a lot of the conclusions that you drew. 
uh, specifically at the beginning, just one, when you mentioned about the Affordable Care Act. But uh, many years ago when I was in college, I was a victim of a psych experiment, okay? But I'm just curious, uh, when you were talking about the pencils, you know, where exactly did this happen, what part of the country? Because I've lived all over the country, various groups of people. I have never been in a situation where the group was mostly black, mostly Latino, mostly white, that if someone knocks over a glass of pencils, that anyone's going to not pick it up. So just curious about that. It just, um, just curious where exactly did that experiment take place? Uh, I, I, think it was, uh, I think it was at Colgate University uh, in, in New York State. Um, remember, it wasn't a group. It was just two people. And it looked very inadvertent. And, uh, you know, it's very easy, and it happened, People sit there and they, they, you know, somebody knocks it over, you let them pick it up. Some people did that. Other people actively picked them up. There, there were variations. Not everybody did one, not everybody did the other, but they're just reporting what happened. Uh, if you're saying the study should be replicated, uh, I think it actually has been replicated, but, uh, Certainly, uh, social science research is always provisional. And uh, if people can come up with further data that casts doubt on those studies, I would certainly pay a lot of attention to that. But that's, that's what we have right now. Question right back here. This is a question to take your research that you've talked about and try to guide the social policy makers in making policy. And my premise is that at least in this country, we have become such a rights-based society that in trying to describe or develop policies, we create safeguards, which are rights, which seem to work against the very policies we're talking about. Your examples. Uh, there was a study done in the 80s, very much like some that you talked about, where they found that teachers were biased against lower economic level children, mostly minority children, so they would ask a question, the child didn't answer immediately, and then they would go to a child that was of a different economic class. And the finding there was is that the child that did poorly found his excitement elsewhere, which wasn't school, which was your circle of failing in school and so forth. But if you went to a teacher and said, we want to overcome this, so we're going to watch, and you said, it looks like you're not speaking to student A and B long enough. What you're going to get is the teacher coming back saying, you're judging my performance. It's going to affect my pay. This has violated my rights. Therefore, how can you do that? And so the question I've got for you is, what advice do you have for taking the social phenomenon you've seen and having people develop policies that don't get underdone by the rights they do to protect the people they're trying to assist. Well, I, 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 think, I, mean, I, I think probably all of us are pro-rights, in a sense. Um, but I think that when we think only in terms of rights, part of what we tend to leave out, and this is true in a wide range of things. We can apply the same thinking to environmental kinds of concerns and so on. We are a society that thinks in a highly individualistic way. And we are very hesitant to acknowledge the degree to which our behavior, our experience, our choices are influenced by the input from others. We, we like to think of ourselves as autonomous actors. And the, the rights assumption is rooted in that. And one sort of implicit element in what I'm uh, describing today is that uh, we're not as auto autonomous as we think, that we are inevitably shaped and influenced by other people and we shape and influence other people. And we, you know, how we get people who don't see that to see that 
is a really important challenge that I wish I had an answer to. Uh, obviously, going around and giving talks like this, especially to people who are already intelligent and well-informed, is probably not the best way to do it, uh, though it's part of it. But that, but that is the struggle, that we, you're, you're right, that we do, we think in rights terms because we deny the degree to which we are impacting each other. In the experiment where the um, Confederates were the interviewees and the whites were the subjects, you said they pushed their chairs farther back and did other things. I wondered if they also judged the interviewees less able in that experiment. And I, presumably, since they, the interviewees were the Confederates, they would be responding the same each way. But in a real experiment, the stereotype kind of loop would take an effect, and they probably would perform less well. But I was interested in whether the interviewers judged them less able. I, I think in those studies, they didn't ask the interviewers to evaluate them, because they wanted as much as possible to not call attention to the, your, your judging these people. They were uh, sort of presented with a series of questions to interview, and the idea was, uh, we want you to help us to uh, do some work in sort of developing these questions, and so we want to see how it goes. And uh, my guess is if you asked them to evaluate the interviewees, there would have, some of their conscious views of I'm an unprejudiced person might have countered that. So what this was looking at is what's going on beneath the surface and they were trying not to call it to the subject's attention to what they were really measuring. So they didn't ask that. And, th and that's why they did the second experiment to see how do people who are in this, who are treated in these different ways actually behave, and then they had other people observe them, and they were observed to be less competent, less friendly, and, and so we on. Have time, we have time for one more question, Adrian. You did not use the term learned help, helplessness in this, and I just wondered if you'd equate this phenomenon to, to learned helplessness, and if so, I contend that it would be much broader than just racial related, that there'd be a lot of other subgroups of people. So. Well, the, uh, I, I uh, first of all agree with your second point. Uh, first point was just a question, so I couldn't agree, disagree, I wasn't disagreeing with either. Uh, but I agree with your second point. I, w I was focusing on relations between blacks and whites, but you can see similar dynamics between groups in all sorts of, of circumstances, other, other groups who have stereotypes of each other. Learned helplessness is one concept in psychology that is, is applicable to, to particularly the part of what I was talking about that I described as disidentification with school. That if you have learned that I'm not likely to succeed, you can then actively withdraw and become unable to gain access to or develop your own abilities. So that's another terminology that complements what I've been talking about. Let's give uh, Dr. Walter a big round of applause. I know uh, several of you still have questions, so please come visit with him after the, uh, uh, the presentation is over. Thank you all, and have a wonderful, safe trip home.